So this was the pilot episode. This was the first one we made. And as you can see, it's we didn't quite have a lot of things figured out yet. There was a lot, not only to figure out sort of character-wise and how to do it, but just sort of like we just didn't know what we were doing there on a, on a sort of live actor set doing trying to do a sitcom. Very strange for us. But um, but it was still very fun. This, this episode, I think, is the most Faulty Towers-ish just because of this very sort of farcical premise of... Uh, sort of stereotypical farcical premise of trying to lying and then having to be two places at once and running back and forth right. it's very Peter Sellers Did you notice um, anything different about me? and uh, in this episode we have oh, Felix uh, the fetus uh, and he was actually made and operated by the Kyoto yeah, brothers uh, you gained some weight? Um, they also did a kitty right yeah they also did pumpkin this is where we met them and then they we ended up um getting them to do Team America. Yeah, because we made met them. all the puppets and, and did all of that on Team America, which was a huge, we huge We met them here with the fetus. We tried a bunch of different things with the fetus. We didn't know if it was right to do a deep voice, to do a high voice, and then we would see it and be like, yeah, and then we ended up, I remember, speeding him up. Yeah. We would shoot the fetus and then speed it up just a little was, bit. Yeah, we shoot him like 18 frames yeah. or something like that. And then he would look kind of more animated, and it was just so that it didn't have that slow movement that so much said this is a little puppet. It made it a little bit more like, what is that thing? Right. And I was watching this the other day, and like the really weird choice we made was that we had him sitting there with no shirt on. And when you remember when you first really? meet him in the Oval Office, and I think it was that we decided, well, it's not as funny if you can't see his little sunken chest and stuff like that. But it just makes no sense that he's sitting there, <laughs> and it's like it's so much funnier later when he's got a suit the on. Suit on they, yeah. You know, that makes a lot more sense. So. I think if I could go back and George Lucas this, I would I would uh, digitally put, a, digitally put a, a little suit on him in the first time you meet him. <laughs> the thing I remember about this show was that the pro-life woman is in the script was, I think, Big Fat Dyke or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like one of those terrible times when like the casting director is looking for a big fat dyke. Yeah. And that's like... That's then some woman came in. She basically did look the part. My name's Michelle Collins. I'm auditioning for Big Fat Dyke. Yeah, it's just one of those really things nice. where it's like in a she South was really Park. nice. She was really great. Where I just could never get over the fact of like, wow, we hired you to be a Big Fat Dyke. <laughs> you really looked the part. Yeah, and you looked the part. Even you know, I mean, she was great. She did a great job, and I think she knew what we were talking about. But it was just like so terrible. I mean, that happens all the times in scripts. You have to cast for the fat girl. Yeah. Or the ugly guy. The pimply guy. Somebody has to come in, you know what? And there's fucking tons of people who will come right in and read for it. <laughs> Just kind of crazy. People are lining up around the block to play Big Fat Dyke. But all in all, this was a pretty, this was actually a really good time in our lives. This yeah. was a good time in our careers. I mean, as I would say, more it was, than it was anything. right before 9-11. Yeah. The whole world, everything was great. More than anything that we've done, I think this was the most sort of just, just fun. And everything... You know, and it wasn't a huge headache to try to make it work just because it, it just sort of seemed to work on so many levels and everyone was so good that uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, pulling out your hair to try to make it work. We had great actors and great crew. And the other thing, you know, this is why actors go do sitcoms is because if you can get a good chemistry and a good kind of core idea, you can actually have a life. I mean, yeah. you get weekends off. These people work like, you know, nine to six. Yeah, we had weekends off. Yeah, but I mean, I mean all sitcoms, it's all sitcoms do. Yeah, you know, that's crazy. why people do them. It's it's a, it's a almost like a form of television that was created around for people to have a week. Nicer for, yeah, because yeah, like when, you, when you're doing a movie or any, you know, even single camera stuff or animation, it just takes over your life. Because there were times where we'd be sitting there and it's like, well, guys, we got to go home. It's like, go home. And it's like, well, the actors, you know, by their skate, they can't work anymore. They're yeah. shutting down. And we'd be like, that's awesome. Let's go out and party. Yeah. <laughs> we, this, was a, this was a union show, yeah. and everything we had done would be non-union. So we had done, like, in you know, other live-action stuff we had done was Cannibal the Musical and Orgasmo, which was all non-union. And so we just worked to death. And everybody was six-day weeks and just, like, 18-hour days. And we would curse the unions for trying to come after us. And then all of a sudden I really like unions because I could go home too. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, we, uh, we're, we're certainly happy you uh, took the time to be with us. And uh, we hope you liked watching That's My Bush because we like making it. But now we're back to making more South Park. All right. See you later. Bye. Hi, everyone. This is Trey Parker. This is Matt Stone. We're here to talk about ourselves and our show. And our show, That's My Bush. Um, it was a great show about a great man. The The whole idea behind this series was to do a sitcom, because we hate sitcoms. 
but let's try doing so a sitcom. Let's go do so one. let's go do one. <laughs> but uh, it was basically like, uh, let's do a sitcom about the president, but make it the actual president in office. Because we came up with this idea about two or three months before the election, I guess. Yeah. Before the Gore Bush election. Yeah. And it honestly was, <clears throat> we were, I'd say, 95% sure that we were going to be doing Al Gore. Um, everyone thinks that we just wanted to do a, a show that made fun of George Bush, but actually we came up with this show thinking that the president, as a lot of people did, a lot of people thought that Gore was going to win. Yeah, he was supposed to win. He was supposed to win, and, and so we were like, okay, and it was going to be called uh, Everyone Loves Al, and it was basically going to be Al Gore, this very robotic you know, guy who, who it, was, it was really the same show. So, yeah, I mean, it, really did, it was kind of, you know, he would have a little bit different character than George Bush, but the idea was... Was a lovable the, buffoon. Yeah, it would be a lovable buffoon, and he would have a, a, a sassy maid and uh, the next door neighbor because that's in every sitcom. Because we really wanted to do, you know, before we didn't want to do a show that just sort of made fun of politics. We wanted to do a show that made fun of sitcoms, and uh, and also we wanted to do a show where we'd had this other idea kicking around, where it's like, what if you had a, a sitcom that tried desperately to be a sitcom? as long as it could, but ultimately just became a farce. So by the first half, we would always think, let's write sitcom style. The second half, we'd we'd always think, let's write farce style, because we were big fans of like Faulty Towers and those kinds of shows that were the same kind of thing, like a family or a husband and wife and in a situation, but they're written completely differently. And so um, that's really where the whole idea came about. Yeah, Faulty Towers was very, we watched a lot of Faulty Towers. But what happened was that we basically are all ready to go with the show, and Comedy Central had approved it, and we were ready to go. We had everyone in place. We knew we were going to shoot, you know, on the lot, and basically we just had a little party where we got all the writers together on the night of the elections, and we're like, okay, tonight we're going to find out for sure which president we're doing a show about, and then on Monday we can seriously start pre-production because we, we know who we're going to cast and all of this stuff, and we were trying to hit a hard deadline of being able to shoot in January, and then the rest is sort of history. Yeah, then we didn't have a show to do because no one knew who the president was. So that was really one of the worst parts about that whole election. Yeah, the country thing. thinks that was hard. You know, it was hard really time to go through. It was us. really hard on us. And we didn't know what show we were going to do. We were just like, wow, that's we had a push- pretty amazing. That yeah, we had. I mean, it we cost had to push a back our money. production. Yeah, we had to push back production. What's that? And then we're sitting there going, well, okay, I guess we're not going to find out who the president is until Monday. And then Monday came around, and then Tuesday, and it just went on and on and on. And then, <laughs> then it looked for a while like there was going to be a recount, and then it still could be Gore. Yeah. And finally, we just had to push the whole production back because we just didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, it was really terrible for us. Yeah, but um, finally, we found out. Okay, it's going to be George Bush. So then we were able to sort of really hit it and um, and figure out, um, you know, what do we want? What what kind of show do we want here? And it was really going to be George Bush and his wife and his two daughters because we wanted to do the family sitcom, the very typical family sitcom, and. Comedy Central just would not let us do the daughters. Big That's fight. right. Yeah, it was a big fight, the Bush twins. Yeah. And what happened on that was that we were kicking around the idea of having the Bush twins be in the show. Um, just as college students, really, just basically what they were. And one of we needed to cast the Bush twins, so one of the writers on the show, uh, we, they, we, he just wrote sides. He basically just wrote a fake scene that was never going to be in any show. It was just to audition people. And actually, I don't think I don't think either of us ever saw it. No. <clears throat> and it had them being lesbians in this scene. Which is not what we had planned. Yeah, you know, which is not what we had planned, but, you know, you could probably tell if someone was a good actor based on it, um, you know. And uh, then, of course, this is what we learned about fucking sides and uh, casting people's. You know, somebody walked out with the, the sides, and then they were on the Internet within an hour, and then it was a big deal. Yeah. And so, actually... At the end of the day, I think it's probably better that the Bush twins weren't in the weren't in the show. I think the characters we got were better, but it was this big stupid thing that kind of distracted us for a while. That really wasn't that important. Yeah. And we decided that you know, okay, it's not the family sitcom; it's the workplace sitcom. You know, more like right. a, you know, whatever. There's tons of them. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so that's when we you know decided you know sort of which care and really sort of the, the characters we had been working on for the Bush twins, we turned into the character Princess, which was now just sort of his bubble-headed uh, secretary. Um, but this episode is actually the second one we did. Um, and we intended it to be the first one we aired, though I don't think we did. I think the, the first one we did was one called uh, An Aborted Dinner Date. And um, 
it's later on on this series because this was really what we, we when we feel like we we'd hit it and we 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 knew what the show was. We kind of like to think of the uh, an aborted dinner date as more like the unseen pilot, even though it was seen. It was seen. It was a pilot. I mean, it's you know, it's you know, when you see pilots for shows, they're usually not as good because it's really hard to figure out what's working, and what's not. So yeah. the aborted dinner date was our pilot. Well, I think it turned out there's some funny stuff. Yeah. Um, this was when it the show started getting this actually was episode really one, good. Basically, and started making sense. And uh, I think we'll go into the next episode to keep explaining because otherwise we'll yeah, then we might do it all here and we'll have nothing to say. All right. So we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> President, the taxpayers are very upset. So the way we did these basically um, was we'd get in the room, we'd all get in a room together, and we'd get a big dry erase board, and on one side we'd write down a bunch of political ideas, like capital punishment, abortion, and, you know, the abortion right. issue, guns, euthanasia, you know, all these sort of political takes. And on the other side of the board we would write typical sitcom stories, like frat buddies show up, wife bombed out, you know, and... Trapped and, uh, in a small space. Uh, you know, things like that, and we would just draw lines. <laughs> you know, let's just do this political issue with right. this sitcom device. The mix-up, the Three's Company mix-up kind of thing. And so, uh, so basically, that that's sort of how we, we started every single episode. So, we can talk about the sets a little bit, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, we were at the, uh, what is it now anyway, the Sony lot? Is that what they call it? Or the Sony lot, yeah. yeah. But it was the first time we would ever shot anything on a lot, so that was kind of fun. Because we had little golf carts to drive around and stuff. Yeah, that's right. They were shooting Spider-Man 2, weren't they? Spider-Man, Spider-Man 1. No, they were shooting Spider-Man. Remember? Because we kept seeing, what's his name, Green Goblin walking around. Oh, Spider-Man 1. Yeah. You're right, yeah. Wow. But, that was um, a long time ago. But uh, we we had this sort of our own big studio, and... Uh, they had built and they built all these rooms from the White House. We just sort of had to determine before we went into production, sort of which rooms we would need, just like a sitcom has to. You know, you basically have your family room, your living room, your your bedroom, and maybe a dining room. And you have to have what your four or five hero sets that you use every week, yeah. and then you're allowed one new one a week or yeah. something. Yeah, like one that. sort of rotating set that you can use to be some special thing every week. And. Uh, so this was all just a language we just weren't used to and was kind of hard for us because we were used to just, you know, doing yeah, animation where it's like, okay, whatever we want. Let's anyway. have them go to the Himalayas right yeah. now. Here, draw that. You know, that, that's easy. <laughs> but here you had to actually build stuff. And I think the sets are pretty amazing. Yeah, they did a great job. They actually job. ended up packaging these sets up and selling them to other big productions that wanted White House sets because they look so good. And we got to go on a uh, private tour of the White House. That's right. There because uh, uh, Ann Garofino, our uh, executive producer, she used to work at the White House for PBS or something like that. And so she knows the White House usher. And he gave us a super secret tour. Showed us all the secret stuff that he wasn't supposed to. Yeah. So we were able to design these to the exact detail. Exact specifications. We took all <laughs> sorts we of secret spy all. photos. Yeah. But um, casting was pretty simple in terms of George Bush. <laughs> just because we came across a picture of Tim. Yeah. In Variety. Yeah. And he was like, doing a play in Santa Barbara. Yeah, I was just talking about this play he was doing. I was like, this guy looks just like George Bush. And I was like, I wonder how, we didn't know him at all. We hadn't, you know, and so we called him in and we couldn't believe it. It was like a godsend. I mean, he just nailed it. And yeah. he was totally, and as the shows went on, it just was more and more apparent that he was just such the guy for the job and yeah. such a such a great guy too. Um, but it wasn't just like he, I mean, it's like he does a pretty good George, he just looks physically, he looks like George Bush, but it's not like he does a spot on Bush impression, he just, but he does capture something about him that, that makes, you know, is actually more important when you're trying to do, you know, eight shows. Yeah, and more and importantly to us, what he captures, actor, yeah, you know? he just, he really captures, um, he's just really sweet, you know, and he's what we needed that character to be, which was just very lovable and sweet and that that's what we you know where everyone thought okay we're going to do a big show where we rip on george bush and we're going to make him out to be a monster and it's like no because that's not what a sitcom would do right a sitcom forces its head character down your throat and says isn't this a great everyday guy that you just love even though he screws up but yeah. heck you know at the end of the day he's trying to do the right thing yeah he's always trying to he's you know he's just kind of bumbling but he's always trying to he's always trying to be good yeah tim was amazing to watch work actually he was it was he's an he's a pretty amazing actor he has it, whatever it is. Yeah. Because he just... You just like him. Uh, he uh, he holds this whole series up. He's just great. And Kristen Miller, who plays Princess, she's a, um, the voice of Lisa in Team America. That's right. She was great in both those, too. She's a great actress. She sure is. 
Yeah. And she's really pretty too. <laughs> she sure is a great actress. And she is a good actress. Mm-hmm. Um, what else did we do? On this? Well, this episode is the, is this the gun control one? Yeah. This whole episode is basically constructed just so we could get to the stupid point where somebody says you shouldn't have the right to arm bears. Yeah, you should have the right to bear arms. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the bear, shooting with the bear was a, a, a bear. That was, was the whole nightmare. reason. It was a bear. Yeah. It was a nightmare. The whole reason we had a bear in this was just to say that dumb line. Yeah. And we ended up using a live bear, right. a bear puppet, a guy in a bear suit, and an animatronic bear. And this ended up breaking our budget, trying yeah. to get us these bear shots. Yeah, just for that stupid joke. And you see how stupid it is, and, you, and to see how that stupid joke. And I also remember when, remember when the bear came on set, no women who were menstruating could be on set. That's right. I remember that because it smells blood. I try, to, I try to apply that rule all the time, even when a bear is not <laughs> That's why I always keep a bear at my house. <laughs> right, we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> So in this episode, the two things we put together were the Star Wars missile defense system along with Husband Tries to Steal Cable, which went together really well. I yeah, think. I love this episode. I think this is one of my favorite ones because I like the guy we got to play the German guy. He's so great. And you can kind of see, too, just because we, we also didn't know quite who George Bush, the character, was. And when you look at the pilot episode with Felix, he's a bit more conniving and a bit more... Uh, you know, you don't really see the sweet side. And it wasn't really until this episode that you really started to see the sweet side of George Bush. And that's when we were like, that's it, that's it. That's what we got to start doing more. Yeah. <laughs> and this had that, oh, this was the first time we said Lemmy Winks. Um, oh, that's right. A lot of people, this was actually before South Park Lemmy Winks. Um, and I, Lemmy Winks the, right the word, there. the name Lemmy Winks just came out when I was writing this joke for this thing. And I just wrote down Lemmy Winks the squirrel. And then... I remember all the writers were all sitting there on set one day while we're shooting the scene and we're talking about what the Lemmy Wink show would be. And uh, that's when we came up with this whole sort of Hobbit Lord of the Rings thing with the squirrel that that never talks and doesn't even really know what's going on and doesn't care. And somehow and that ended yeah. up being in South Park. That ended up being in South Park. It also ended up being in Mr. Slave's ass. But when yeah. we were originally talking about it, it was just going to be a Lord of the Rings parody. Yeah. Because what's the main character in Lord of the Rings? What's his name? Frodo. Frodo basically is a squirrel. He doesn't really do anything the whole time. He just walks around and people talk to him. <laughs> and so we just, you could just replace, the idea was we're going to take Lord of the Rings and replace every shot of Frodo with a little squirrel sitting there and with a little ring. And see if it would still work. And just see if it would still play. And I think <laughs> it would. would. Yeah. <laughs> you could just run around and be a squirrel. This guy, remember that guy, that, there's a guy in this that plays the Aust- Austrian head uh, the guy. German, oh, the Austrian so guy. Good. Yeah, he was great. He was really good in this. He was very Python. Yeah. He was British, actually, I think. I think that's why he really got, I think he was like half British, half German. Like, that's how he knew German, because one of his parents was German, but he was really a Python guy. This guy, I've seen in other movies playing a, ser- like, in, like, a Gene Hackman movie or something. He's, like, the serious version of what he's doing yeah, right he, now. Yeah, he's, like, Mr. Mr. I'm an old army guy, old crusty army guy. <laughs> so, it worked for us. Look at that SDI system. It's so funny to hear some applause and stuff. You know, it's, like, a lot of sitcoms, uh, like Friends and the big ones, you know, they, they shoot in front of a live audience. And they definitely enhance all their, there still have people that work on that show that enhance all the laughter and all the applause. And so you'll get some real live action stuff that, you know, everyone's getting cheers and everything like that. But then they will bring that to a technician and make sure that everything, you know, where people kind of laugh, they they make it sound like people were super laughing. Yeah, there's no dead jokes. They all. And we just couldn't, we didn't, first of all, we didn't want to have a live audience because we wanted more control over the show. But we also just, there was... Things we do in this sitcom that you just can't do in front of a live audience. There was just too many. Like have a bear. Like have a bear. <laughs> so it was basically like um, we had made the decision. We'll totally control that because the whole tra- laugh track and clapping and all that was part of the language to us that we were kind of making fun of because we obviously don't do that in South Park. But it was, you know, having everyone go woo when Princess walks in and all this stuff that was mostly, if you listen closely, it's always the same people because it's basically us standing there watching things being shot and all our friends and whatever and you know a group of like and the crew so you know a group of about 25 people doing all the applause in the lab and then someone filling up on all that but there I, I was watching these the other days and like many many times i can hear me laughing i can hear matt laughing and a lot of times it's because we're the only ones who are laughing because we're yeah, the other think it's funny and no one else does yeah i went to the i went to the sound mixing things of this remember that and i, I went and did the the watch the guy do the box for the for the laughing and it was such a soul-stealing thing to watch that guy realize that 
that you know you've watched all this television your whole life and there's been a guy running that little box and you've been hearing this little box this little laughs your whole life laugh it just so, stole my spirit in such a laugh way. monkey clap monkey <clears throat> And they can make it like, oh, like kind of laugh. They can make it like, ooh. They can do all these different kind of laughs and layer it. And God, it was just like, it was like looking behind the curtain. It would suck so bad. But it does work. Without it, it's not a sitcom. Wow, she's a great actress. All right, we'll move <laughs> on. Is this is where she gets bigger boobs, yeah. right? Yeah. See, this is a really good episode. We'll see you on the next one. So this is my favorite That's My Bush episode. And hands down. <laughs> If, uh, it if, is insane. If I were going to show people one episode of That's My Bush, it would be this one. <laughs> Just like that. It is. It is insane. We did a lot. I mean, this, this show was like really ambitious too. Like as far as like, you know, we have animatronic cat. We have Laura and um, the maid going. You know, uh, we went and did offset stuff, right? Where they were, you know, going on their journey, going to the Indian place. I mean, there's lots of special effects. It's like, the, you know, it wasn't just people sitting in a house. It's like, uh, so it was pretty ambitious as far as what we did. This is the this is the Three's Company episode. Or no. episode. This is the mix-up. The, the misunderstanding. Because the whole time that, you know, <laughs> Laura thinks that she has a problem downstairs. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, George is talking about the cat. I did have a cat named Pumpkin growing up, and the cat just it lived way too long. It was just one of those. It, like, lived to be, like, 22 and the damn thing it was just this total exact feeling of like dude will it just die and it was like we'd take it to the vet and go I think it's time to put her down he'd be like no she's doing alright and it's like dude she's like doesn't get up or anything and it was just like we just kept waiting for her to die on her own it was just such a bummer and she pretty much looked just like that <laughs> <laughs> this has Kevorkian in it too yeah it was played by an actor I always see around too oh yeah what else is in this show Hmm. The Punani Indians. That was another. <laughs> that was one of those moments where you know we're like writing stuff and it's like okay and now Punanian. this is showed that we were animation guys because we're like now cut to Laura Bush and Maggie right. are scaling a waterfall you know and they get to this remote Indian village and base and you know people are just like guys what are you doing this is supposed you can't to do be, that in know, a sitcom you got to be in a living room or a bedroom and we're like nah we can do it we can do it and so. We just it's, sent out another unit yeah. you know, with some doubles to go out and shoot people climbing wild. I love the Punani Indians, too, because the Indian place looks totally like the sitcom yeah. outside. Yeah. I love that. When you see on sitcoms, it's kind of like the soap opera thing where they're outside and it's moonlit. I think that's so funny. <laughs> it was really great, too, having uh, Jeff Melman. He, he directed all these. And it was uh, really different for me because I had never been involved in anything where I wasn't directing. And, um, you know, I was just purely writing and and you know we were producing this stuff so you're still working you know you're i was still on set and being directing people with jeff but jeff would already have a lot of just all that you know he'd done so much television he'd added them all blocking and doing things that i never would have thought of which is like oh yeah he should be like doing something instead of like yeah south park everyone's always just standing there waist up talking in the camera (laughs) you know it's just like we would walk in and see a rehearsal of this stuff we had written sometimes the day before and now Here's people walking around acting it out, and you know you're like, wow, this is pretty great. It was fantastic. Unlike the Team America production that we always bitch about in our in our commentaries, this production was one of the most fun productions we've ever had. One of the most stress free. The crew was awesome. The cast was awesome. Everyone did a great job. Nothing went horribly wrong. Yeah. We had like pretty reasonable hours. Yeah. Well, was, yeah. We just kept doing that. Yeah. Forever and ever. It was a really super, really, really super expensive show. Yeah. For Comedy for Central. Central. Um, but production-wise, it was one of the most. It was one of the most pleasant things we've ever done. And I think it's kind of. I mean, I'm kind of glad. You know, it was like I don't know how long we could have kept going because to some degree it was a parody of itself. You know, this show. And so it's like, I really question how much more we could have done with it. And you know, and also. The simple fact that this all happened before 9/11, um, yeah, you know, it, right before, but right before 9/11, this if era. we'd have been, you know, there on the set and doing some jokes, and then that 9/11 happened, and then going, oh boy, now what do we do? Yeah, it would have. I don't know if it would have played well after, right after 9/11. Yeah, so I, I kinda, think it plays well now. Yeah, but I think the right after 9/11, people weren't really interested in seeing a show like this. But um, so I, I'm kind of stoked on the way it all went down. Actually, I think we did a great eight episodes, and then we just kind of hung it up. It's, kind of, it's like doing a big movie, you know. A lot of British sitcoms do that too. I and mean, there's only yeah. what 13 episodes of Faulty Towers. There's yeah. not very many. Yeah, we're like that. We're like Faulty Towers. We're just like Faulty Towers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Next, 
ecstasy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Ecstasy, yeah. Sorry, we just had to figure out which episode this was. Like ecstasy. It's been yeah. a long time. War on drugs. Yeah, so this political issue was the war on drugs coupled with <laughs> your mom's your mom's coming to visit and she hates me. The in-laws. <laughs> yeah, the in-laws coming to visit. And uh, I actually really like this episode, too. Yeah, it's funny. The, uh, Mrs. Or, uh, Laura Bush, the Bush mother. Barbara, Barbara Bush. Bush is so funny in this. Yeah, she's great. And you get to say things like man jam coming out of Barbara Bush's <laughs> mouth, which... Your breath, uh, I can spell the man jam on your breath. A lot of sitcoms at the time weren't doing. They weren't saying I can spell we broke the man new jam man, on your We breath. broke some man jam ground <laughs> with this episode. Um, this was, uh, believe it or not, we did have to explain to Tim what it's like to be on ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Yeah, he did a pretty good job. Yeah, and we're like, you got to grind your teeth, and you got, you know, and you, you feel really great, and uh, I think you pull it off really amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tim is really funny. <laughs> but um, what else is in this episode? We had a big rave at the end of the yeah. at the end of the episode. It was just kind of that thing where it's just like, you know, we didn't realize, you know, it's like, okay, now we have a rave. And it's just like, guy, you know, you're trying, we, we shot these in what, like two days? Each episode was two days? Yeah, Wasn't I think that so, it? yeah. So it was basically like you'd spend the whole week writing and getting ready. And unlike South Park, we kind of had sort of a script going into it. And then we would be polishing it all week uh, as they were rehearsing. And... You know, it was, it was nice because uh, whereas in South Park, basically, I get to watch retakes. I get to watch animation and then send it back to animators and say, change these things. We would come down and watch um, some scenes being rehearsed yeah. and then give some notes and stuff like that. And, and uh, it was it was a really cool thing. And then we'd have two days to shoot. And unlike a lot of sitcoms, we'd be like, OK, now there's a giant rave going on. And right. like, well, how big do you want this rave, guys? And we're like, well, you know, like a rave, like 200, 300 people. And they're just like, no, it's a sitcom. They'll be you can't 15. do that. They'll be in the bedroom. Yeah. What about a scene that happens in the bedroom? That's Princess. She's a really great actress. Yeah, she's great. Um, that might be it for this episode. Yeah, I don't really know what else to say about this. We, we should probably move on. deal with this gang banging drug is scum. So this is a very typical next to last episode of a show because as with most le- next to last episodes of a run we really don't remember much about it um I, we do remember this was when we coupled uh protecting the environment environmental issues along with the trapped in the small space concept of sitcoms which is a almost every Tried and true. Yeah, almost every sitcom almost any show has the trapped in a small space episode, or like Happy Days has about 14 of them, the sort of trapped in a small space episode <laughs> where you take two characters, lock them in a vault or whatever. An elevator, happens, usually they get stuck in an elevator. And then they've got to talk about stuff. Archie Bunker got stuck in an elevator with a, po- a pregnant Puerto Rican woman, right? Yeah. Or something like that. He also that. got stuck in a safe with Meathead. Yeah. yeah. You take the two characters that have the, you know, have the stuff to work out, you trap them together. Yeah. So we're like, okay, let's do the farcical version of that and just have all different characters being trapped in different small spaces and then switching and getting trapped in their small spaces and then everyone working out all their issues together. <laughs> That's really all I remember about it. <laughs> That's all I remember about it. What else can we talk about? There's a lot of that, like, you know, the... um that whole thing about doing a cold open you know and trying to come up with some cheesy joke and then going to your that was hard those are the hardest dumb things titles. but you know what happened from doing this actually that actually what made South Park better is that we did this and we had this cold open and because of that it would, we were able to go to commercial we were able to do our three commercial breaks and we did a pure sort of three act structure this one had a cold open right. but then it had three distinct uh, parts and so at the time, we were actually doing four parts in South Park. We were kind of doing like five minutes and five minutes and five minutes and five minutes and doing weird act. And so from this, we learned like, wow, this really makes it clear. The three-act structure comes out better and is like, let's do this with South Park now and just start doing the open of the show and then go to commercial and then come back and do three-act structure with South Park. Right. And ever since we've done that, like the shows at South Park have been more. Yeah, I think in the first seasons of South Park, no one wanted us to do that because like, you, you know. You got to keep people interested, so you have to just go right into the show. Yeah. But I'm glad we don't do it anymore. It, it has made the it has made the show better. <laughs> and there's this guy. And when I talk about 
you know, part part of the reason why this was such an easy time and a fun time was because just all these actors were so great and fun to be around. Yeah. And uh, everyone was such a good sport. You know, everyone knew we were trying to do something kind of different. And, you know, they, they had to do things you wouldn't normally do in a sitcom. Um, but, you know, e- everyone was really awesome. And, and everyone was so good at, at, what, at who they were being and what they were being. And there was, like, no divas except for Kurt, right? Here. Except Kurt, for Kurt Fuller. Kurt Fuller was definitely a little diva-ish. Yeah, he, he always wanted stuff. But he's awesome. <laughs> he, he did come in. He was, one of the la- he was the last person we cast. Yeah. We had everybody else, and we needed a good Carl Rove, and then he came in. Of course, we recognized him from other stuff, and it was, he just, he nailed it. And he always has a funny take on almost every line. Yeah. He was just, he was one that you never really had to explain twice sort of what the joke was. Like he Basically, was, Carl Rove is you, Kurt. Yeah. He's kind of an <laughs> asshole, kind of divish, super funny. <laughs> But you know, I mean, just like he, he fell into that role, much. we would always call him the diva on set, and he would just laugh and everything. I mean, he's, he really is a great guy. He is fun. He's a fun guy to be around. He's really fun to be around. Actually, he's a fun guy. And Marsha's hilarious too. He made. She's great. All right, we'll go on. That's the last time we worked with actors, though. This was a good actor experience for the most part. Yeah, usually we say we'll never work with actors. And but this was pretty good. These actors yeah. were all really cool. Yeah, they were all really good. I gave it their all. Let's move on. So this was the last episode we did, and this was all... We, we knew the season was over, and we, we kind of knew it was going to be over because, you know, we all knew from the beginning that in order to sort of keep this thing going, it would, it would almost have to do better than South Park because... Uh, just because it was so expensive and, you know, shooting on a lot and all this stuff instead of animation. So I think we all kind of knew this was the last show. It was just sort of like the last week at school. You know, it was yeah. like everyone was kind of bummed out, and but kind of like psyched that that we, we had done a cool thing, and um, but and that's why we decided to make this episode where where George Bush gets fired, that being the uh, that being the yeah. sitcom thing, yeah, <laughs> getting fired, and we decided to just do this thing where we got to go through a bunch of other sitcom formats. Um, one quickly right after the other. Right. So it's sort of like the Jeffersons and then Cheers and then right. what was the one with the spin? Or? Spin City, yeah. Talk City or something. Or it happens in like an advertising agency, the, yeah. you know, the Midtown yeah. ad agency kind of place. Am I being fired? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny right there. Yeah. And then he ends up a, Mex- a wrestler. Yeah. And we didn't know, like we had said, they were shooting Spider-Man at the time. We did not know there was going to be a wrestling scene in Spider-Man. That's right, we didn't. We came up with it first. In fact, we think they stole that from us <laughs> because we were on the same lot together. They they got the wrestler thing from us. Sam Raimi came over one day, and I think he stole it. Carl? See, look how Kurt nails that. At me? Yeah. Let's see, anything else? I can't remember. This was a long time ago. It's yeah. hard to do commentary on this. Now I feel no, now I don't feel so bad like when I listen to like commentaries on First Blood and stuff, and you have to hear these directors go, "I don't really remember how he did that." And you're yeah. Like, yeah, it is kind of hard to remember. <laughs> this was only what was this four years ago? Yeah, it was like four or five years ago. I guess it was almost six years ago, wasn't it? It's 2006. It was 2001. Five years ago. Oh. See, now we're just now we're just babbling. Like other people do on their commentaries, <laughs> but that's what can you can imagine when they when have to do a whole like two hours. Like, then what are you doing? <laughs> what, what Dick Cheney hijacks the show because <laughs> he got fired. That's pretty funny. A funny idea. <laughs> Can't believe he's actually in the White House. That's our man. <laughs> <laughs>